All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and it is September the 1st, and it seems like it was just yesterday that we were in the middle of summer. But here we are, September the 1st. The kids go back to school tomorrow. Halloween is just, what, a month, two months, a month and a half away, Craig? Two months away? And then Christmas, and the circle starts all over again. 1-800-610-7035 is worldwide toll-free. My email address is xzone at xzoneradiotv.com on all social media sites, xzoneradiotv, and our website, www.xzoneradiotv.com. I hope that everyone listening around the world has had a wonderful uh, Labor Day weekend. You, everybody was safe and sound, and... Um, here we go. We're getting ready for the fall season here on the X Zone. And we're starting it off with a very special lady. Her name is Diana West. And uh, she is the author of American Betrayal, The Secret Assault on Our Nation's Character. That was published in, I believe it was 2013 by St. Martin's Press. And The Death of the Grown Up, How America's Arrested Development is Bringing Down Western Civilization. And once again, that was Martin's Press in 2007. Now, in the fall of 2013, Diana Diana brought out a companion volume to American Betrayal, titled Rebuttal, Defending American Betrayal from the Book Burners. Joining me now is Diana West. And Diana, welcome to the X-Zone. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Great having you. I've also got my my paperback of American Betrayal is actually coming out tomorrow. Wow. So this is very timely indeed. Yes. That is great. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, Diana. Well, I am a journalist. I write mm-hmm. a weekly syndicated column. I have since um, 1999 and is syndicated by Universal UClick. And ever since 9-11, the column has sort of been a Petri dish and experimental research chamber for trying to understand um, Islam it's War on the West um, mm-hmm. and other fun subjects like that. I'm based in Washington, D.C., and I've been here for quite a while, actually. But I'm originally from Los Angeles, California, so go figure. Yeah, I, I've got to tell you something. Even up here in Canada, nobody can understand what happened or what the, what the reasoning was behind 9-11. There are so many conspiracy theories. There are so many possibilities. There are so many hypotheses out there. Mm. But you know what? There's one thing for sure. Yes. It's war. Yes. <laughs> I would call that an act of war, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I do I do think one of the more interesting conspiracy theories, mm-hmm. um, and I would say also that conspiracies are often more than just theories. I mean it only takes two, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> But one of the more interesting one has to do with the man who is now the head of Al Qaeda, um, Zayman Al Zawahiri, um, who then was number two at the time of 9/11. But the interesting developments that um, the late Litvinenko, um, the former Russian FSB agent who was killed um, by polonium, a small nuclear device implanted in mm-hmm. him, essentially back some years, who actually um, put out there that he, he was aware of, of Zawahiri being trained by FSB inside um, the former Soviet Union, and that, you know, there are interesting connections between al-Qaeda mm-hmm. and the Russians. Always intriguing. Very much so. You know what? Uh, we've talked over the years about the different conspiracies, and uh, one of the main ones is that this was a black flag off, that it was actually the the Americans, uh, the American government, who took down the Twin Towers just in as a pretext to enter the war. And I listen to those conspiracy theorists, and I say, you've got to be kidding. 
You've got to be kidding. Yeah, yeah. that one doesn't resonate with me. No, <laughs> that not, one doesn't work. Not yeah. at all. Not at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it, yeah. We, here, we, here we are, 2014. We're watching in the Middle East. We're watching ISIS. We're finding out that Americans are going over and fighting uh, for, the, uh, for ISIS. There's, yeah. th- there's danger that we may have homegrown terrorists within our within our boundaries, not only the United States, but Canada as well. Sure. How close... Well, it's not a danger, it's a reality. It's right. a reality. Oh, it's oh. been going on a long time, sure. Do you think, based on all the people that you've talked to, based on your books and mm-hmm. based on your experience as a, as a professional journalism, that 9-11 was just the start? Well, of course, it was just the start, and it was also a midpoint. I mean, we had other acts of, of terrorism, certainly against the West, certainly against America. Um, you know, really going back, if you go back to the beginnings of the Palestinian Liberation Organization and the, remember, hi- airplane hijackings? This yeah. was this plagued the late 60s and 70s, so part of a long war. All right, Diana, what I'd like to do is, when we come back, let's go to the beginning when all okay. this happened. And bring our listeners up to date. Great talking to you. Diana West is my guest. Her website is dianawest.net. And we'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Exonation, Diana West is my guest this hour, www.dianawest.net. And Diana is the author of American Betrayal, The Secret Assault on Our Nation's Character, The Death of the Grown of, of the Grown Up, How America's Arrested Development is Bringing Down Western Civilization. Uh, let me see, The Rebuttal, Defending American Betrayal from the Book Burners. And her website, once again, is www.dianawest.net. All right, Diana, take us to the beginning when all this started. Like, you know, going through high school, going through elementary school, going through Bible school, you heard about the turmoil in the middle in the Middle East. You know, you, there were wars all over the place. Tell us how the wars way back when are affecting us today with the terrorism that we are facing. We can certainly go back to the 1970s for some instructive lessons. Mm-hmm. Um, that was when we start seeing. Uh, well, we start seeing Soviet expansionism in the third world, and we start seeing uh, very sensational kidnappings, bank heists, airplane, airport shootings, and hijackings. We start seeing hijackings as an absolute blight on international life. Mm-hmm. Um, we forget this. I think we forget that how much terrorism there was in the 1970s in Europe, um, mostly striking from, you know, I mean, we had Italy, Sweden, we also had Japan. We didn't think about it, though, at the time as being Islamic in nature. We talked about Arab terrorism. Mm-hmm. Um, there were some very intrepid journalists at the time, namely Claire Sterling was one, who noted the, the, the relationship between this, quote, Arab terrorism with Cubans and, and Czechs. And she wrote a very important book at the beginning of the Reagan administration coming out in about 1980 called The Terror Network that laid out the international scope of terrorism with the nexus in Moscow. Um, Bankrolling, support, training. I mean, this was what was going on at the time. And it was very hard to pierce the the naysayers and and people who prefer to live in La La Land. And this this was a big, big moment um, when her book was actually embraced by the incoming Reagan administration. That was the time of the first term. And they really regarded that book as their, as their Bible um, and were, were, were very much inspired um, polit- you know, politically and in terms of foreign policy by it. But this is really where we see, I think, the beginning of this current, this current wave. It is of a piece. And it has changed. It has morphed. Um, we've seen, you know, different tactics mm-hmm. used. Um, the, the Arabs in the Middle East realized very soon it was not the direct strike, but we see the rise of Palestinian terrorism. We see the peace process. We see the intifada. We see sort of the de- definition of Israel as the um, gigantic bully in the area by making the Palestinian cause seem a very tiny, tiny group, um, rather than connecting it to the larger Arab world which is how it started, and, of course, completely um, cutting any sort of memory of the ties to Soviet world 
terrorism. And, and, you know, this is kind of one of the important pieces of it that I think is important to keep in the backs of our minds. But I think it's a piece that not very many people actually add to the equation, that there right. may in fact be a Soviet connection in the, in the terrorism that we're actually seeing today. Right. Well, it's very hard to run down. I mean, these, 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 these things are very difficult mm-hmm. to um, nail. And, but I think that once we know the context, if we understand the context of Soviet subversion and Soviet infiltration, going back, and this is actually the subject of American betrayal, going back as far as 80 years, back to the 1930s in America, particularly with the, um, the, the beginnings of the uh, Roosevelt administrations. We had four elected Roosevelt terms. He, of course, did not finish the final term. He died in office um, in 1945. But we had this, this period of time in America where we had the advance of Soviet agents into the federal government, American traders who were actually working or trying to influence events for Moscow. So we had this, this absolute transformation of the American government that, again, is also part of what we're dealing with today. It's, it's, it's a very long past. And I think the, the bottom line is that when people try to understand these things, there is the need to broaden the context and not just look at the event of the day or the last, even the last couple of years. There's a long path leading us to this incredible chaos and very dangerous moment. You know, I remember during the Kennedy assassination, there was actually a connection made between Lee Harvey Oswald and the Soviet Union. And it was right. thought by right. many right. that he was actually yeah. an agent for the Soviets. Yes, yes. Well, there are all kinds of theories, sure. of course, about, about the Kennedy assassination. It seems that um, you know, some of the more solid ones, the ones that we can sort of look at actual um, movements and, 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 and relationships, does seem to indicate Cuban involvement, yeah. um, certainly, um, Castro's involvement. But again, we remain at, you know, another one of these open questions, which, which really always puzzles me how it can be that these these stunning public events can somehow take place in such a way that there is never any real answer as to how they happened. And, and then we move on from that. And so th- this becomes a very um, tantalizing thing, I think, for, for so many of us. And um, certainly, certainly it inspires me to try to find answers in our past, because I really think that it is so essential to get the past right, at least as right as we can, because you know, we're, not, we're not gods, we're not superhuman, but we have to try to see through the narratives that get laid down. For example, Islam is a religion of peace. We had that in America from the day after 9-11 coming right out of the Bush White House. Islam is a religion of peace, and this became a mantra that all facts had to somehow support. And so we end up with a new narrative laid over, really, you know, you believe that or you believe your own eyes. It, 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 becomes, it becomes that kind of a tension um, that I think people are still struggling with because the leadership here, the elites, are tremendously vested in, in these sorts of um, ways of dealing with strife that actually, I believe, defy reality, defy history, defy culture, defy, defy reporting. So we're in a, a real quandary, I think, because we are so far divorced from even attempting to get at the real facts because they're so disturbing to people, and they're when, so disturbing to people in power. When did it change from we the people to I the person? To I the person, well, I would say, what do they say, the 70s was the me decade, mm-hmm. right, in um, here. I suppose it was a bit of a long time coming, but again, I, I tend to credit many of the changes, much of what, what modern America is like today does go back to the Roosevelt years. This yes, is I... where we see the introduction of socialism into mm-hmm. the um, way the economy is organized. It's where we also see the um, institutionalization of interventionism, which above and beyond World War II, continued on in a way that I think did twist the whole notion of an American republic. We never again went back to an American republic with, with a national interest. And I think that that is a very dangerous thing when countries operate really without a national interest, without their own people at, at heart. And I think that this is something that we tend not to discuss or debate um, because these assumptions have really become part of our um, way of of expressing ourselves and dealing with things, and you know these these notions um, are very much rooted in the last you know eighty years again. But 
looking at what's happening in Afghanistan and elsewhere, we see unravelings um, and how they don't work ultimately. And then you see who suffers. And again, it's it's your own people. We see this in Europe with Islamic immigration, for example. Who suffers? Well, it's the people who can't afford to live in the enclaves and go to the private schools and so on. It's the people. And later seem to be, in Western world especially, seem to be divorced from their own people at this point, more having more in common with various transnational elites and so on. And I think that's why we see so much of this uh, intervention and, and activity elsewhere while your own <laughs> your own countries are, are hurting and your own people are sure. certainly bearing so much of the brunt of it. Do you think we're too politically correct? Oh, for sure. But you see, even saying politically correct is a form of political correctness, I would ah, say. Yeah, that's true. Political, oh, cor- right, yeah. Well, political correctness is sort of, I, I feel it's, I mean, certainly I've used the term for decades now, yeah. <clears throat> probably since the um, 80s, I would say it started really being used. But again, where does that term come from? One of the earliest iterations we know of is from Chairman Mao, political correctness, not meant ironically, of course. But I think what it it does is is the use of the term has almost become a dead end in our thinking. We don't think where it comes from. And really, these ideas of lexicons, limited word lists that become acceptable, that also train your mind, that comes right out of Marxism. It's the Marxist-Leninist playbook to control your speech because when you control your speech, mm-hmm. you also tend to control your thinking. And we are certainly, certainly prey to that. Well, who's controlling us? Well, we control ourselves. I mean, this is one of the things. We have a First Amendment here and, and free speech and mm-hmm. so on. But we, we learn to censor ourselves. And a lot of it is the, um, the herd mentality at work. Um, a lot of it is also reacting to stimuli like career You lose your job when you say certain things. You lose your job when you think certain things. You don't get invited to parties, which is strange to say, really seems to count much too much in my profession, (laughs) I would say. But there there is a a very disappointing lack of courage just in the way people allow themselves to be cowed by... um, fear of being called names, hate monger, Islamophobe. Yeah. Relating that back to the past, I compare the Islamophobe as a um, real shutdown of thought and speech to the old days when people were told they were red baiting to stop discussion of communist infiltration. You're a red baiter. Well, that stops someone cold and also might, you know, have some real solid results in terms of um, problems in career and so on. I mean, we always hear about the other kind of blacklist of supposed free thinkers who are actually communists, but there was a tremendous blacklist also enforced against people who wanted to uproot communists in the government, for example. So hmm. it's, it's, it's unfortunate. I always wonder how it could be that we, we are so cowed and so easily led when we do not have a gulag archipelago, as, as the unfortunate people in the Soviet Union did, to control their speech and to control their thought. Um, but we reacted very often as if we did. Here in Canada, it, uh, here in Hamilton, I'll give you a, a personal example. We used to have a sign on the side of the mountain because Hamilton is a city that's built on the escarpment, the Niagara Escarpment. And we had a beautiful sign that would say, Merry Christmas. Mm. That had to change to season's greetings because it wasn't politically correct. Right. You can't call it well, a Christmas tree anymore. It's a Yule tree because Christmas tree is not politically correct. We've got to go to our news break, uh, Diana. But I'd just like to tell you what I usually tell people who complain about Canada and the way that many people aren't as politically correct as they'd like them to be. Well, you know, wherever the plane landed, it also takes, takes off from. So if you don't like it, go back to where you came from. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with my very special guest this hour, Diana West. And her website is www.dianawest.net. This is The Exxon. My name is Rob McConnell. And I can hardly wait until December until I can start telling everyone once again, Merry Christmas. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and whenever I start thinking about the changes that we have to make, and we have to make them, there's no two ways about it, it just boils my blood. It just boils my blood. 
You know, we had to change Happy Easter to uh, a springtime festivity. We have to cha- We had to change Christmas to season's greetings. Well, you know what? The way I look at it is, this is what we've been saying for years and years and years since the beginning of this great country of ours. Merry Christmas. And in other countries, they've been saying Merry Christmas. But because of social pressure, because of political pressure, because of religious pressure, we have to change. And if you don't, well, you're going to get wrapped on the knuckles very hard. Whatever happened to our rights? Whatever happened to what we, the people, want? It makes no sense to me that we have given up so much, so easily, to the man. Oh, yeah, sure, okay, I'm sorry, we won't say that anymore. Oh, no, no, sure, I'll change my signs to season's greetings. Oh, no, I won't buy any Christmas cards that say Merry Christmas. We'll knock out Easter as well. What's next, Valentine's Day? Because it's a saint. That's You know, that's going to be going, and then St. Patrick's Day, well, wait a minute, that's a saint? He's going to be going too. The only people I can see benefiting from this are the turkeys. Because I'm sure they'll come away that they'll figure that this too was part of a religious act. And we can't have Thanksgiving anymore. Once again, if you don't like it, go back to where you came from. Plain and simple. I'm a Canadian, a proud Canadian. No, I, I love going down to the United States. It's 45 minutes from my doorstep to, to enter Buffalo, New York. Love it. They're great people. You couldn't ask for better neighbors. And when I see and I hear what's going on, man, my heart breaks. It really does. And one of my biggest bones of contention, Diana, is you've got men and women who volunteer to protect the United States, who volunteer to, to protect freedom, democracy. And, and yet, you know, God bless them when they come home. Well, we all, we've all heard the stories about the Veterans uh, Administration and what's going on there. We have well, that, you go yeah, on, dear. Yeah, just the beginning. Yeah, yeah. you know, and and yeah. you and I can go on for hours just on on that alone. So, in in yeah. your opinion, is there an end to all of this without bloodshed? Oh well, um, of course. I mean, it's possible that the subversion will continue without bloodshed, and mm-hmm. people at a certain point will become so cowed that they will find that they become completely subjects and not citizens in any any definition of the term. Um, but yes, there is also the, the possibility that things will, will come to bloodshed. Um, certainly, I can envision people being made examples yeah. of. I don't, I don't envision great, you know, enormous battles taking place like the old Civil War in the 19th century. Mm-hmm. But I do imagine losing people to uh, the fight for liberty and who would be made examples of. I do see that as a very distinct possibility. Um, Speaking to your point about Christmas and all, I think it's good to think of just for a long, little bit longer past the term political correctness to remember, as I'm sure you do, that the Soviet Union, uh, international communism, one of its animating um, desires is to eradicate mm-hmm. religion, to eradicate Christianity. It is, it is godless communism. One way of doing that is taking away, is taking away our markers of religion. It's taking away the convention of, of, of expressing joy in a, in a Christian holiday. Um, it, it's, it's all part and parcel of this movement to divorce ourselves from our roots, from our culture, from our religion, from our traditions of, of liberty, um, of individual liberty, of rights, freedom of conscience, all of these things that disappear in a collectivist system, whether it is communist or whether it is Islamic, there are tremendous overlaps between communism and Islam, which is, is surprising sometimes to people because, of course, Islam has a god and communism does not. Um, but in terms of collectivism and totalitarianism and the hostility to the individual, to the individual conscience, 
to free speech, to freedom of religion, the parallels are, are uncanny. They are so similar. And also in terms of the need for external enemies in order to grow, also very similar. So these are very dangerous um, waves that blend and take strength from each other and, you know, in different, in different cycles of history. So it's important to keep, keep in mind when we give up, mm-hmm. season, when we go to season's greetings, um, because we have to or think we have to, what we are really giving up. We are giving up culture. We are giving up identity. These are things that I write quite a bit about in, in The Death of the Grown-Up, because this, I do believe, can be understood in terms of that metaphor, that it is the infantile or the juvenile individual who does not fully express himself, does not take his rights, does not live as a free-functioning citizen. So this is part of what what that explanation is all about. If you don't mind me asking you this question, what, what, yeah. was, what was your opinion, or how did you feel when religion was taken out of, the, out of schools, like the Lord's Prayer was not allowed to be, to be said in the school system anymore? And, and what about the, where is it, the U.S. Naval Hospitality Centers? There was a court case where an atheist group actually won a decision from the court where all the Gideon's Bibles had to be removed from naval base hospitality centers. And yet right well, yeah. and and yet the American and the Canadian creeds or or the declarations all saying God we trust. Right. Right. Well, it's it's all part of this this effort, the same effort. Um I don't believe I, you know in the American public school system I don't know when Lord's prayer would have been taken out. Um, I went to a private school. Mm-hmm. We had an ecumenical prayer every day. I don't know if that still exists at my, my old school. Um, but these are the types of markers we can observe it, that do tend to strip the public square um, of freedom of religion. I mean, the ability to practice one's religion. And, you know, the, the communist pressure is one or the mm-hmm. left pressure is one, but also the Islamic pressure is another. And we are, we are really seeing that um, play out across the Western world, in Europe, in America, and Canada, where we do yeah. see the Islamic pressure um, really taking the upper hand at leading some of these battles to um, remove the vestiges of the host culture. I mean, you start, when you start yeah. thinking about people who live in Holland or people who live in Switzerland or people who live in California, as the, maybe not California, but certainly in Europe, as the indigenous people, you know you're in trouble yes. because this is kind of what it's come to. They are, we are, we are. I think the best way to put it is, I believe we are living through very advanced in the period of population replacement. We are being replaced, and and it is a very gruesome thing to observe when you actually think of it in those terms. Why are the people that are elected by the American public put into power by the American public, allowing this to happen? Well, it's the, the best question of the night. I mean, why? Yes, I mean, this is something, you know, we constantly struggle with. Um, I think something does happen to people when they come to the center of power here in Washington, and it does seem that, that they are co-opted, and it does seem that at a certain point, it doesn't matter what party you're in, what political party you're in, you are working for the status quo, whether you're, you know, the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, who's mm-hmm. top of the Republican Party on Capitol Hill here, um, or, or a Democrat. You are working for the status quo. You are working for the power elite. You're working to stay in office. And if for some reason, the incentives here have become completely skewed. And again, they lose touch very, very, very drastically from the American people. Look at our immigration situation. Oh, my we gosh. have no southern border. Yeah. We have no border. Essentially, if you have no border, you don't have a country. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is the gravest threat to America that has ever happened. And it's as if Nothing's happening. And even though if you look at poll, poll after poll conducted by all manner of very yeah. reputable established organizations show that the American people want less or no immigration. They want borders. They, they want people to obey the law well, when they come here to be welcomed as immigrants. I mean, this is, they, you know, it's amazing. But our, our leaders who get elected yeah. every couple of years on Capitol Hill, they seem to be powerless. But on the other hand, on the other hand, both our countries were built by immigrants. Mm -hmm. All right. Now there's a right way and a wrong way of doing things. Yeah. And, and my hat is off to every 
immigrant who wants to come to Canada, or, or, and I'm sure you feel the same way about the United States, if they do it the right way. Right. Well, of course. But also the the host country has Mm -hmm. a prerogative to say, you know, we have an awful lot of people here who are still speaking about 50 languages and we need to assimilate, we need Mm -hmm. to teach, we need to make them Americans or make them Canadians. This is what seems to be um, absolutely outside the pale, the concept that people should come to uh, a country like Canada or America and become American or Canadian. And this, I think, is one of the big differences. The other one is, certainly in America, the bulk of immigration to America came without any social welfare state on the other end. In other words, my ancestors came um, in, the, in the 19th century, and there was no social safety net. They yep. did not receive a single dime from the government. And it was very difficult. My grandfather, for example, dropped out of school in second grade and had to, you know, deliver suits to help his family because his father died. I mean, this is the kind of difficulties, yes, immigrants were in, but it really drew immigrants who wanted to work, who wanted to build the country, as opposed to immigrants who want to partake of the honeypot, partake of the social welfare state. And this is what we have now. So the rest of us start feeling like worker bees simply to support people coming across illegally, including who knows how many representatives from ISIS yes. or Al-Qaeda or Hezbollah or drug gangs or mafia. I mean, we've got absolutely no southern border, Canada, so yeah, it's, it's, beware. It's, it's, cr- it's crazy. And last night I was watching, excuse me, something on CNN that was about... I used to be on CNN. <laughs> ah, where, where there was all the racial turmoil... And President Kennedy would take the authority of the National Guard away from the governor and federalize the troops so that they would fall under federal jurisdiction and he was the commander-in-chief. Mm-hmm. Now, and this was during the time uh, in Alabama when two, two uh, African-American students wanted to go to a college. Mm-hmm. Let's take that same scenario. Here you've got the border to the south that is basically disappeared. You've got men and women, God bless them, law enforcement agencies, the Border Patrol, who are doing their very best with very limited resources. Why then can't the National Guard and other members of the military, as well as other members of Homeland Security, be dispatched to guard that border? Because the President of the United States doesn't want the border to exist. I mean, that's kind of where we have to go with this conversation. There, mm-hmm. You know, many, many people, especially I find conservatives, maybe they're just um, trying to give President Obama the benefit of the doubt, or, I'm not, or maybe they just can't take their mind there, but generally people call him inept. Yeah. They call him, um, you know, not up to the job, etc. Well, frankly, I don't believe that. I, I've been studying him for many years now and have, have quite a lot of evidence to the contrary, mm-hmm. but in this particular instance, what you've just outlined is what any person, perhaps even my dog, would come up with in terms of trying to stem this incredible um, out, uh, overpouring of, 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 of illegal aliens, of unaccompanied minor children, of disease, of terrorists, of drug dealers, of who sure. knows what coming across. So you have to conclude then that the President of the United States, who has so much power at his disposal, is not interested. It's crazy because I'm, I'm sure there are lawmakers in Washington who are saying, Mr. President, we've got so many millions of immigrants that are coming into the country. This is going to cost the taxpayer so many millions of dollars. Money doesn't grow on trees unless I've been planting the wrong crop in my backyard. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's it's true, but... I can count a couple on my, you know, we have Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama, a great patriot. We have uh, Congressman Louis Gohmert, mm-hmm. another great patriot from the state of Texas. I can't count a whole lot more than, than those two. There are, there are some others who are deeply concerned. But essentially, you do not have um, critical mass on Capitol Hill to, one, defund Defund the agencies, the federal agencies, the executive branch agencies that are doing this to the American people, namely um, the Department of Health and Human Services, which is behind um, so much of this illegal immigration because it's a massive Truly multi trillion dollar bureaucracy that actually feeds on this. We have these 
so-called religious uh, charitable organizations mm-hmm. that you cannot actually connect them to any bona fide church or synagogue or anything else, but they co- they're called <laughs> religious um, charities that get incredible contracts, hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government to assist these illegal aliens as they come across. This becomes a money, it becomes a money tree for people. We don't plan the right kind of trees, yeah. you and I, Rob, but, but the federal employees and contractors do, and this essentially is why it is so difficult to stop. But I say, and I actually had the opportunity to attend a, a meeting of high-level congressional staff not too long ago in Senate and congressional staff on Capitol Hill, conservatives, and I asked them, I had the opportunity to speak, and I said, why don't you defund these agencies tell President Obama, we are not going to partake of this. We're not going to give you one more penny because that is their power. No answer. It doesn't happen. And so this problem continues. And I can't explain why they don't do that. Diane, I think it's abdication of all their responsibility. I agree with you 100%. Diana, please stand by. You and I have to take our final break for this hour. Great conversation with a great lady. XO Nation, visit www.dianawest.net. This is the Exxon. My name is Rob McConnell. I'll be back on the other side of this break with Diana West as we wrap up this hour. Right from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I think I'm going to open up a religious organization, uh, Craig. <laughs> what do you think about this? The Holy, the Order of Holy Shih Tzus. Why not? It's going to the dogs anyway. We'll be back. Don't go away. Exonation Diana West is my guest this hour. www.dianawest.net is her website. That's www.dianawest.net. Let's talk a little bit more about American betrayal. Is America being yes. betrayed, and if so, by who? Well, America is being betrayed and has been betrayed for decades by some of its most cherished leaders by some of its most important figures. Um, This was my conclusion after the several years of research I devoted that Mm -hmm. really suggested to me that the history we've been taught is so much fakery, is so much narrative. Um, And I found great resistance. The reason you've mentioned my rebuttal, I found great resistance to challenges to the narrative that American Betrayal um, presents. But essentially what the book does very quickly is it combines intelligence history mm-hmm. with the general history, with the general narrative that we all know, the sort of the front of the stage with the backstage, the spy story with the diplomatic story. And everything looks very different when you actually are able to um, interweave what the infiltrators were doing and how the influence they had on the front actions. And so it, it's, it actually rewrites a, quite a lot of American history of the 20th century, again, going back to the Roosevelt years, um, things look very different when you do put the two together. It's, it's quite shocking, actually. Tell me, who were the book burners? The book burners were uh, led by some people that are considered conservative gurus in America. Um, David Horowitz, mm-hmm. Ronald Radosh, these are former communists or radicals who became conservatives after Ronald Reagan's section, second election, his re-election. Um, and they deeply... Uh, they launched essentially a smear campaign, which is why I had to write a whole book to defend myself. Oh, my gosh. It, it's probably a whole show in itself to try to get at the bottom of it. But um, it was essentially because the, what American Betrayal does very, very simply is it, it flips the reputation of Franklin Roosevelt, and it also casts new light on Senator Joseph McCarthy. These are the twin bookends, I would say, that it most affects. So it really changes the way everything looks when you go back. You know, you and I over the, over the past hour have been talking about the Russian connection in one mm-hmm. manner or another. Here's a question right. for you, a very simple question. Is the Cold War still on? Yes, I think it is. I, I, I think the Cold War is a misnomer, however. I think there were a lot of hot wars in between. Mm-hmm. But yes, the press of, the press of Marxism-Leninism continues, but the problem now is it is inside us. And this essentially is the lesson that I learned in my research. We have been transformed, and so what we see are a lot of remnants, in a sense, a lot of traditionalists, of various, you know, the Tea Party in America, for example, attempting to be reborn, attempting to regenerate something that has been taken from them, something that's been changed so deeply 
by this tremendously successful infiltration. I question whether we won the Cold War. I question whether we won World War II. Because you look at the map at the end of World War II, and you see the Soviet Union all over Europe, and you eventually see communism in, in, in the Orient as well, in Asia as well. So this doesn't look like victory to me. Um, but it, it's, a very, it's a very complicated story. Well, we'll have to have you back on so that we can talk more about this. But I do want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. To you and your family, a very happy Labor Day, and I hope you had a great weekend. And I look forward to the next time when you and I meet here in the Exxon. But before you go, we've got about 50 seconds. Tell our listeners how they can find out more about you and where they can buy your books. Thank you. Well, dianawest.net is where all of my columns and blogs are, as well as um, links to all of my books, which are available at Amazon and other fine booksellers. Um, but I have all the, the information at my website. and that, You can find everything there at dianawest.net. Diana, take care of yourself. Keep the great work up. It's been a pleasure and honor talking to you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. Diana West, www.dianawest.net. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news at six and a half minutes past the top of the hour as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away. <laughs> 